If you got hacked or lost key data, would your business survive? Tonight, our business reporter Regina Manyara engages Lloyd Owando, a cyber security architect at Dimensions Data on Imagine Cyber Threats and how to avert such incidences and ways to ensure business continuity in cases of lost or compromised data. Tonight on Prime Edition, we'll discuss how to secure yourself against a cyber threats. Joining us tonight is none other than Lloyd Owanda, who is a cyber security uh, cyber architect at Dimensions Data. Thank you very much for making time. Let's start off with the cyber security landscape in the country. How is it looking? According to the threat intelligence data that uh, we get as Dimension, uh, Dimension Data and NTT, being our mother company as a whole, um, I can say the cybersecurity landscape at the moment is quite reactive. Um, we're in the midst of playing a catch-up game. I feel that digital transformation happened way too fast, um, and cybersecurity was left behind. So often with the, with the interactions we have with our clients when we are, are delivering solutions to them, we do notice that um, cybersecurity is often an afterthought um, during the digital transformation journey. So the focus is all on adopting these fancy technologies to deliver business outcomes, and cybersecurity is often brought up during an incident if it has not been driven by strict compliance or regulatory requirements. So in general, um, we still see um, a lot of uh, reactive approach to cybersecurity and it being handled as an afterthought. Are we more susceptible and vulnerable to cyber threats now, currently, in 2023 than we were three years past? I would say yes. We are increasingly more susceptible to cyber threats, and um, the reason is one. Um, our reliance on technology, uh, digital platforms, channels is increasing. Um, different avenues to carry out business operations. Um, for instance, in finance, we have big mobile banking platforms, we're having breakthroughs in M-Pesa and the likes, you mentioned but a few. But what does this do? This also creates more avenues for exploitation, more channels through which attackers can exploit. And so I do believe that um, with the rapid adoption and growth of technology, digitalization is increasing our susceptibility to um, cyber threats. It's opening us up to more um, um, attacks, risks from cyber security. What is your view on the regulatory framework in as far as securing, securing data? I do believe um, in terms of regulatory compliance requirements, um, we are in the right direction. We are on track. The issue is around driving adoption and ensuring enforcement of these regulations and adherence. I believe that is where um, we still need to pick up the pace, but the framework has been set and is sufficient and continuously being optimized to ensure it's covering all necessary gaps. Mm -hmm. uh, as a techie, and allow me to use that, um, what do you say are the emerging cyber threats? I would say um, one of the, we call them the advanced persistent threats. Okay, so um, these are threats that tend to, I would say, um, act slow and lay low. So infiltrate an organization and perform reconnaissance over a long period of time in order to stay undetected. So these threats also um, affect multiple aspects of an organization. So if we look at the evolution of threats over time, we had, um, before the advent of the internet, we had computer viruses, and if you installed an antivirus on your machine, you were um, sufficiently covered. When the internet came along, we started to get network-based um, attacks. Um, with the adoption of cloud, uh, mobility, um, IoT, all these have started to create more avenues, and now we are noticing attacks that span across all these areas. So I would say we are in the midst of, um, uh, I would say, um, fighting against what we call the advanced persistent threats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and these are categorized by some um, aspects like phishing, um, ransomware, uh, and many others that, um, that you've seen in the recent attacks that have been occurring. Just recently, we had a, you know, a retailer operating within the local market, uh, you know, put out a statement and saying they've been hacked. So from where you sit, uh, what, is, uh, what is the uh, you know, most popular uh, form of uh, cyber threat that uh, you know, we are dealing with in our local space? 
I would say within the recent years, uh, the most popular threat is ransomware. Um, ransomware and phishing attacks. Um, phishing attacks, businesses operate and rely on email communications as a corporate, uh, as a corporate means of um, uh, talking to your supply chain, to your customers. It also makes it um, an easy channel through which attackers can be able to, um, I would say, trick uh, users into sharing um, sharing confidential information. We have seen it in um, supply chain attacks um, where an attacker can pretend to be one of your suppliers, send you an email to change your bank accounts and uh, we have money being transferred to wrong accounts. In terms of ransomware, we know the key thing around ransomware is um, it, 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 it prevents businesses from operating by creating, um, by, by making your systems and your data unavailable and then holding you at ransom. So this has been very um, profitable for attackers, and uh, what we are seeing that uh, these are the most successful and most trending attacks that are impacting our, our environment today. Are we investing enough in uh, cyber security? Yes. I would actually say from uh, our experience, companies are actually investing a lot, a lot more than they should be in, in cyber security tools. Um, the challenge now is around maturing the security posture of our organizations. So you find that uh, organizations have bought multiple security tools, but they're not still getting the level of protection that they expect. And the reason is because all these tools have been built to operate in a siloed manner, and instead of them helping security teams be able to proactively detect and prevent threats. They're creating more operational overhead. They'll still need a lot of reliance on human input and it still leaves security in a position where we're actually playing catch up. We're still finding ourselves having to um, respond to breaches instead of being proactively uh, in a position to prevent them. So what we are doing right now is we're ensuring that customers are on a journey of maturity. They have already done a significant investment in terms of cyber security tools. Uh, we want to ensure that these tools can work together to provide more actionable insights that can help organizations be more proactive in terms of um, prevention of threats. And even after a breach, it should put you in a place where you can recover from a breach and be able to remediate any impacts of that breach within the shortest time possible. How do you recommend that you know, we bridge the skills gap? say it's adequate. It's, it's a well-known fact that there is a very large skill gap, especially in the field of cybersecurity, not only globally, but uh, within the region. And this gap is um, increasing, increasing as we progress. So um, I, I would say there is, an, there is inadequacy in terms of that. And um, um, one of the things we are really trying to do is ensure we are spreading um, a security awareness, uh, not only to our customers, but in general to the public, in order to get people to appreciate the importance uh, of cyber security, the reality that we are living in with cyber threats and the impact that they can cause in order to bridge that gap. But as it is, um, we still see um, a significant skill gap in terms of cyber security. Mm -hmm. Now, let's take you back to one of, uh, you know, the emerging trends, so to speak, the use of AI. From where you sit, is AI a threat to cyber security? Let me say this. I say AI is AI. How we use, how we purpose the AI is, is what really matters. So AI can be used can be leveraged by both attackers and the cybersecurity experts. So, and we have seen attackers increasingly leverage the power of AI in order to generate new attacks. Um, and we have also seen AI being adopted by security operation centers to improve um, detection and prevention capabilities. So I would say, depending on how it's leveraged, uh, it can be a threat to cybersecurity, and it can also be a bonus, a, a positive uh, for cybersecurity. What uh, we would recommend is that it is regulated. The use of AI is regulated in a way that uh, it, we should limit uh, the malicious 
uh, use uh, of AI and ensure that it is purposed for more productive uh, and non-malicious intent. We have seen the financial sector, you know, bear the brunt, or rather it's the low-hanging fruit uh, for cyber, uh, cyber threats. But now we are also seeing that these particular uh, threats are gravitating towards, you know, the individual. So how does one secure their data? Uh, great question. So the first aspect around securing your data is knowing where your data is. You cannot secure what you can't see. So the first key aspect is visibility. Um, know where your data resides. Know who is accessing your data. Know how it's being accessed. Um, once you have visibility into your data, then you can be able to employ the necessary controls, knowing where your data resides and how it's accessed. You can be able to employ the necessary controls to ensure it's only used for, I would say, trusted activity, which brings me to a very interesting point. Um, <clears throat> we always um, encourage a principle of never trust and always verify. So even after understanding where your data resides, ensure that you have visibility into who is accessing your data and what they're using it for, and always ensure to verify that the access to your data is actually um, authorized and ethical. In the highly unlikely uh, event that there's a data breach pointing to a security breach, especially maybe in a small business or in a business, so to speak, what are the key steps that one should take? If you're in the event of a compromise or you do acknowledge that you have been compromised, the first uh, aspect is incident response. Um, by incident response, um, first of all, be able to identify and mitigate the threat. Ensure that you have mitigated this across the entire, I would say, scope of breach or impact. Um, upon uh, mitigation, of course, forensic analysis to better understand um, the full impact and uh, the kind of um, loss that you may have uh, incurred during this, uh, this incident. And after that, um, ensure that you have put in place the right controls and you've covered the gaps to prevent uh, this from happening. Please, this conversation, and uh, I hope you clear it out for us tonight, that in the event that uh, you notice you have been hacked on whatever platform, especially on a mobile platform or, you know, on an iP, you switch it off. But then we're also hearing a counter uh, statement that if you switch it off, you're giving hackers more time to actually work on your device and your account. How do you respond to that? Um, okay, so it's a, it's a very interesting uh, scenario, but I, I, would, I would disdain from switch it off. I would say isolate, isolate or quarantine. So similar to when you're having an outbreak, uh, the first thing is to quarantine all the affected uh, parties. So if you notice that your device has been compromised, don't quarantine it from accessing um, other resources. Quarantine it from accessing um, or spreading uh, the breach to um, any environment that you're in. So, of course, that would uh, involve um, a sort of what I call an air gap, to establish an air gap environment. Um, next, of course, is ensure that um, all your data is secure. So, have controls in place around um, locking and securing your data passwords, and aspects like multi-factor authentication. So in case, for example, my device has been stolen and someone is trying to use my M-Pesa or my mobile banking application to do a transaction, if I have a verification process that would ensure that I would have to approve that transaction, then that would provide a mitigation uh, in case I've been breached and an attacker is trying to use or leverage what they have breached to try and compromise or steal uh, any assets. So I would say isolation is key. Uh, once you isolate, uh, remediate. Um, once you remediate, of course, um, restore and establish the right controls. So learn from it and establish the right controls to prevent it.
what I hear is right controls. Now let's talk about, look at now businesses. There is, um, you know, um, business continuity planning. This business actually is compromised. Yeah. Data is lost, yeah, or data has been tampered with. How do we ensure we can recover this data? From my aspect, where I sit as a cybersecurity architect, um, when we look at business resilience, we look at um, ensuring you have capability to respond to attacks and in, and to to respond, sorry, and to recover from from breaches. So, first of all, do you have the right security tooling that can help you detect activity that could be indicative of an attack? And then next, with that same security infrastructure, are you able to isolate uh, the impacted area of this attack and remediate? So from a cybersecurity aspect, if we're looking at business continuity, I would uh, say um, focus is on your capability to detect and respond and remediate um, uh, your environment in case of a, a breach. Let me take you back to matters of data. Is data really lost? I would say it's, it's, it's lost in the sense of um, it being unavailable to, I would say, the authorized parties who are, who, have, who, has, who are actually supposed to access it for legitimate usage. But if we look at it from the broader perspective, it's, it's never really lost. If your data is exfiltrated, it will reside somewhere within the digital space, uh, within the internet, and that's why there's also a famous saying that the internet is forever, and you should always be careful what you have, have up there. Now, government is working at, you know, increasing access to the internet by coming up with over 25,000 Wi-Fi hotspots across the country. What is your take on that? Okay, I'll start with my general take. I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a great opportunity. It's going to open up um, a lot of avenues for innovation. Um, with that connectivity and with the, with the progression of technologies like IoT, uh, we're trying to build a more connected uh, environment. But from a security space, uh, one of the things, of course, we do recommend is that even as you set up that connected infrastructure, it should be secure by design. Uh, because, like we said, um, with the adoption of technology, it also opens up other avenues or channels for attackers to exploit. So, of course, there will be an increased attack surface uh, with the adoption of that uh, technology. Um, but at the back of our minds, we should ensure that as we adopt and build our digital infrastructure to support innovation and boost the economy and growth of the country, we should do it with uh, a mindset of have it secure by design. So what is your take in taxing the digital space? In my opinion, I believe this is a move towards strengthening uh, the economy. Um, and it, it makes sense if, um, if the government can create an infrastructure and that facilitates platforms that will enable us to um, run businesses, to transact, then in that sense um, it creates an opportunity for the economy to grow. And I believe it's, it's, it's an incentive uh, and a, a, a channel through which government is seeking to boost the economy. Um, but like I said, um, everything should be done in moderation. Um, it, it makes sense as an economic growth and boost initiative, and um, it will just depend on how that is being executed uh, for us to really uh, determine the intended outcome of this. Lloyd, where do you see uh, matters of you know, cyber security as far as the country is concerned long term? Where I see us heading in terms of cyber security, um, we'll see a lot of growth or a lot of an increment, let me not say growth, increment in terms of regulatory and compliance requirements, of course, as we continue to adopt uh, technology uh, in order to ensure that it is utilized or used in a safe manner. We talked of artificial intelligence, um, the growing use of it. Um, I see regu re regulators taking um, a stronger steps towards ensuring that we actually use technology in an ethical manner. Um, also see a drive towards uh, automation. Um, automation, I would say, and cloud adoption. So right now, 
we're actually trying to drive a lot of campaigns and awareness around uh, securing uh, the cloud. Uh, one of the big disruptors we're seeing going into the future will be the cloud. Um, we have not noticed it with smaller businesses uh, adopting public cloud services uh, instead of being, uh, setting up um, expensive infrastructures. So I'm seeing a lot of security now moving towards uh, uh, or, or being focused towards the cloud in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Very well said. We have been speaking matters of uh, cyber security there and take home is never trust and verify. We have been speaking to none other than Lloyd Owanda who is a cyber security cyber architect at Dimensions Data. I'm Regina Manyari. You've been watching Prime Edition.